say to Jesus, you get out of here, so we don't get what you do. <laughs> That's good. Uh, but the point is that we've all been given our fingers to work with people, with families, whatever situation God puts us in, and that's where God expects fruit from us also. God bless your worship this morning, and let's begin with the first day. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We trust in this 
spirit that we press in the kingdom of eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, mercy has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sin. It is a call in our day, servant of the word, and by Christ's authority, I forgive all your sin, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Forgive us for 
and which forgive us when we reject your unfailing love and grant us the fullness of your salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is brought to us by Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Let me sing for my beloved. Let my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it. He hewed out a wine vat in it. He looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge. It shall be devoured. I will break down its wall. It shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be turned or hoed, but burned and thorns shall grow up. It will also command the clouds, and they will rain. No rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah, and his pleasure planting, and the looking for justice. But behold, bloodshed for righteousness. But behold, an outcry. This is the Lord of the Word. Thank you. Thank you. The epistle reading comes to us from Philippians. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised in the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law of blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his righteousness and may share his suffering becoming like him in his death, that by all means possible I may attend the resurrection from the dead. Now that I have already obtained this, or I am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Took his servants and beat one, killed one and stoned one. 
Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same thing. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will, re they will respect my son. But when his tenants saw the son, they, the, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. Jesus said to them, Have you never read, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken into pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that, they were, that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking, and although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thank you. 
grace, mercy, peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Right. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be pleasing in our sight, O oh Lord, our strength and God be given. Your friends in Christ. The parable that we have today is an allegory, rather obvious, and the Old Testament reading helps for us to see. The master of the house is God. The vineyard is the nation of Israel. And the tenants are the people. And of course, with him, the chief priests, and also the Pharisees. And the servants are the prophets. And the son, the Jesus parable, is Jesus. The master of the house wasn't just a landowner, he planted a vineyard, a fence around it, a wine press, built a tower. And then the master of the house leased the vineyard to the tenants. Sort of a share crop or arrangements where the owner would give his share, then the others would have their share. And when the season grew near for a new vineyard, it takes about three years for it to be grapes. When the season was near, he sent his servants to the tenants to give his and let me read to you again what Matt read to us before. This is verse 35. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. And here is where the parable takes a real terrible turn. Because this alludes to the children of Israel in the Old Testament who killed God's prophets. They killed Zechariah by stoning him. Jeremiah was placed in stock, and Uriah was also killed. Now, verse 36. Again, he sent servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. In verses 37 to 39. Finally, he sent his son, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and we'll have his inheritance. And they took him, throw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. And then Jesus asked a question. And he asked, what will the owner of the vineyard do when? What will he do to those ten? And the chief priests and Pharisees answered, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyards to other tenants who will give him his fruit and season. And then Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and will be given to people who will produce fruits. And the chairs and the chief priests and Pharisees call on the priests. The Bible said that they perceived that he was talking about them. And they would have arrested him right on the spot. Except the people thought he was a prophet. Or looked at him as a prophet. And so they didn't dare to do so. Now, it's obvious Jesus was speaking of the chief priests and Pharisees because they perceived that's what he was doing. But parables are also for us. The Word of God is for us. And so we should ask what, what lessons are there for us in our day? We read that the Word of God and all scriptures were written for our learning. And what can we see? Well, we can see that God is patient. 
That's the first lesson. God is patient. And he relates God's incredible story. And this is really a story about God. The owner of the land had invested quite a bit in his vineyard. And he trusted his tenants with responsibility. Cultivated, harvested. You know, that takes a phenomenal amount of trust on his part. But God has also had a phenomenal trust in us. When he was ready to claim his harvest, he sent representatives, not just once, but twice. His patience seems to be unending. And he says, I'll send my son. However, the wicked tenants failed that last opportunity, and the son also was cast out and killed. If it were any other landowner, he, he would have brought it a long time before and got rid of those tenants. But in the parable of Jesus, the landowner is uh, God's not like us. God is love. One of the essential characters of God is love. And love is patience. But the gospel makes clear to us also that there is an end. God's patience. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who will produce fruit. So there comes a time. And we do you remember there is a limit to God's patience. Parables are sort of to be like a mirror. We look at the mirror, and in it we should see ourselves. And today we ought to see ourselves as tents. The Bible really doesn't call us tents. The Bible calls us stewards. We are stewards of all that God has given to us. What we have as a possession, we have for a little while. But the Bible also reminds us that stewards owe fruit back to God. And I guess if we really understood this, that God is the owner of everything, then we would my object to give me a credit. Well, in the story, the workers had become accustomed because the owner was away for a while, but this was their land. They sort of had a sense of ownership. We worked very hard here, and now we're the ones that have. But the landowner could say, you never owe any, owe many things. You're just the guest here, not the master. And that's something we have a hard time getting over ourselves, is that we're not owners of this earth. Because if we did, then we'd just really enjoy the gifts that God gives to us. And God had placed Adam and Eve in the garden for their enjoyment. Not really to always want more and more. Uh, tenants today, or let's say stewards, think they're working for themselves. And then they could face the same thing that happened to the old tenants. Christian stewardship, as we read about the scriptures, is taking care of everything that God has given us. That would be this earth, as well as the people around us, and everything else we enjoy. And, and we think of our own stewardship and giving a portion back to God of what is His. See, not a portion of what is ours, but a portion of what is it? And that keeps us on the right track. I like the old stewardship story I heard a long, long time ago. And it's about a church that wanted to put it on the dishes for the Sunday school because 
they wanted their kids to have enough money. And so they sent people out to the members to ask them how much they would pledge, how much they would give. And they came to one house and they asked the man, how much would you give for the new Sunday school building? He said, no. And he says, well, we need the Sunday school building. How much are you, are you going to give anything? He said, no. And quite exactly. Um, they said, well, why? You can help with this. Why don't you want to give any of your money for the Sunday school building? And his answer was, because I don't like ice cream. Because you don't like ice cream? He said, what the heck? What's that got to do with your, your, your big money for this building? And he says, well, if you don't like ice cream, that's my excuse. One excuse is as good as any if you don't want to. And he went, oh, if you don't want to do that, any excuse will do. Now, there can be reasons why someone would do it, but if it's just an excuse not to, well, that's a different problem. John 3.16, some probably all of you know from him, it's about how God gave the Son. I, I want to point you to the verses right after John 3.16. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. The only sent his Son. God sent his son. He didn't send his son in order to condemn us, but to reclaim us, to recover us from our own selfish goodness. He called us back to life. He kind of came to, to lead us home to him. Jesus doesn't exclude anyone from the kingdom. He doesn't have to, because that's what we do ourselves. God sent his only son to the world to save us, to reclaim us. Now, if you want to know what kind of fruits he wants, we look at the life of Jesus. And there's a long, beautiful list that he revealed. What do we see when we look at Jesus? Love, mercy. Forgiveness, justice, generosity, compassion, wisdom, truth, healing, thanksgiving, self-surrender, reconciliation, peace, obedience, humility, and we can go on a long time. Jesus showed us all of that on the cross. And he showed us the depth of the love of God that he had for every one of us who are tenants or stewards in this world. And, and no way in fact, and that's what we know. A paradigm <clears throat> like this is one that we look in the mirror and we see the good news that the Son came to give us life. And we want to receive that sign with open, thankful hearts all the way. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding in our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Let's rise and confess our faith in the crying God, speaking the words of the nice Isaac. I believe in one God, the Father of all might, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being the one substance with the Father. 
by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us in the conscious body. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God. And he will come again with the Lord to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and Maker of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiping glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, you have planted us as your own family that we might bear good fruit to your glory, and grant to us grace that we may be faithful and show forth in our lives the good works to glorify you and serve your purpose. Lord, have mercy. And Heavenly Father, watch over the health of all our leaders, and especially our brethren in the hospital, and others who are ill. Guide and protect all who pass and force judge our law, and spare us from disease and fear. Deliver the poor from want, help us to provide jobs for all. Lord, have mercy. And Heavenly Father, look with mercy on our families who are sick and with special needs. Especially we name before you Ed Wilkins receiving chemotherapy this week. And we remember at home, Jeanette Nichol, Sandra Krauss, Diane Chevin, Ken Brower, and Judy May. And a senior star, Bill Richardson. And also those that are known to us individually, we name in our hearts. Guide all the healthcare professionals to serve those in need and help us to be helpers and encouragers. Lord, in your mercy, and help us, O Lord, through word and sacrament. Draw us closer to Jesus, rejoicing in the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus, and grant us through this gift that our sins may be forgiven, our faith strengthened and the mystery of faith proclaim. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
that we should all find the places. Give thanks to you, Holy, Almighty Father, and everlasting God, who gives the who in the multitude of your saints did surround us with such a great cloud of witnesses that together with them we may praise you, and therefore with angels and archangels, all the company of heaven, we love and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and saying. Thank you. 
Joyce. 